Okie dokie. Oh. A podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Samuel! Here I am. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are continuing to work our way through the gospel narrative. This is Gospels Part 45. Last week we spent a lot of time towards the end of our session kind of working out the details of the story of Simon the Pharisee. Jesus was over at his house having a meal and this woman, seemingly random woman, came and was bathing Jesus with her tears and expensive perfume and oil. And we kind of flipped the story on its head by saying that she wouldn't have experienced shown these experiences, these emotions to Jesus, if not having some type of encounter or um, being able to experience forgiveness by Messiah beforehand, which is a very radical idea because we don't think about that a lot um, with this story. And we we put that directly with Jesus' parable about which person is going to show more gratefulness Dependent on the amount of debt that they had beforehand, um, and so right. we we left off the time still wrestling with that because there you can take both instances legitimately. We were just trying to offer up an alternative. Yeah, it's a very interesting picture, and of course, you know, we've said this, I'm sure, just a number of times. It's not like everything we're saying has to be the end of the story, and we're right, and everything else is wrong. It's just. This is our way of presenting what we believe is a cogent, consistent, thorough, complete story that actually makes sense. And so, you know, we're trying to use the text to do that. So that's, that's a it. call back all the way to the intro episode. I remember you using cogent back then, too. Ah, do you have to look it up when I said it? <laughs> no, but I should have. <laughs> I love dictionaries. They're awesome. All right. Well, let's go ahead. Uh, We have finished up with the the woman there at Simon the Pharisee's house. And now there's uh, one trailing little bit uh, that's kind of sort of connected to those stories. At least if you were looking at our notes, you'd understand what we mean. Uh, But we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 8, just verses 1, 2, and 3. Very interesting little bit. So let's do that. says this. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others, who provided for them out of their means. Well, I, you know, even if you've read that before, sometimes you hear and you go, well, that's kind of surprising. Mm-hmm. What's going on there? But there's a number of things to talk about. Let's, uh, first of all, when it says that he's proclaiming and bringing the good news. Well, Samuel, Samuel, what's another word we use for good news? Uh, gospel. Gospel, yeah. And again, we see that very explicitly, the good news is, Samuel? It's that the kingdom is at hand. Yeah. Proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. Now, I, I just want to make this point. I just happened to hear some people over the last week or two, John 3.16. Okay, Samuel, when you read that, is that some really good news? Definitely. Yeah, it's great. But our point is simply to say it isn't the good news. It isn't the gospel the way Jesus and the apostles thought of it. Now, you've probably heard, you know, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, describing a zillion things. You've probably heard it a million times, whatever. But when you're calling anything other than 
the kingdom, the good news, or the gospel, you're short-circuiting the story. You're messing up your understanding of what's really going on. Now, you may have never heard anybody talk about the kingdom as much as us when we're, you know, doing the podcast, reading through the gospels, but if you've been following along, paying attention, you know that that's not our fault. It's only because that's what is there. Jesus was talking about the kingdom, that is, proclaiming, and he was doing signs and wonders as a demonstration or foreshadowing of that same kingdom. So he was bringing the kingdom, just and as it Paul, said there, Luke 1. An- another good thing that adds to this point that you're bringing up is that this concept of gospel in first century times was actually, it's so cool that it's, it's like, it was like a Greek phrase that was used predominantly connected with a king and his kingdom message. Um, yeah. That's a Marty Solomon nugget. Like he said, like, hey, and that the Greek way of saying it's called euangelion and Marty and his teaching points out and it brings it all home to say that Herod had a euangelion. He had a gospel about Hellenism, like telling the people like, since you're the center of the universe, center of the world, like this is what is good news for you. And then even before that, Alexander the great, he had a euangelion. And so like God of the universe, like he is, (laughs) it's just so poetic justice that he would bring Jesus into the scene and he would say, ah, I've also got a euangelion, but it's yeah. unlike any other worldly euangelion that you've ever heard. So that just further defends that the gospel is about the kingdom because they used it yep. in that time frame with kings and their kingdoms. Yeah, that's a great mental image and, and info to bring to bear. That's really good. So yeah, when we're talking about gospel, we're talking about kingdom. And I I'm going to venture a guess, Samuel. We may yet talk about that some more on this podcast. I I would think so. At least once. It could happen. Yeah. All right. So what else do we have in here? Uh, So he's going along. He's proclaiming, bringing the good news. um, uh, And and the 12 were with him. So, I mean, this is pretty obvious. It's 12 of Jesus's disciples. There were many disciples, but he had 12 that he had separated out to be with him continually. He called them apostles. And then it says also some women. Now, okay, this wasn't completely unheard of, but it definitely wasn't ordinary either. Jesus consistently elevated the status of women. He welcomed them even into his circle, the circle of disciples, not apostles, we know that, but circle of disciples. And they're going to play some very important roles during and even after Jesus's ministry. And this is good to see because the exact same thing happened back at Sinai. God, through the giving of the Torah, had elevated the status of women compared to every other culture around them at their time. And Jesus is doing it again to the culture in his time. So it's, a, it's just a great picture and, and, and thing to have in your head. Yeah, we deal a lot with patriarchal societies when we're going through the Bible, and yet we can see God himself, God become man in Jesus, elevating the status of women. It's a great, great image. All right, so what else? Uh, and then he starts naming them. Some of the women who, uh, and it mentions they've been healed of various things. But the first one is Mary called Magdalene. Now, if we were going to use a, uh, maybe try to say it in modern English to get the name across a little uh, more clearly, the way we might say it, we would simply say Miriam from Magdala. We wouldn't say Mary called Magdalene, right? But Mm -hmm. you you get it, Miriam from Magdala. And here's the thing. How do we describe or define who she is? Well, for the most part, we're just going to tell you who she's not. She is not Martha's sister. 
She had a sister named Mary, not the same person. Okay, this is not Jesus' mother, also named Mary, not the same person. And just to be thorough, this is not Jesus' secret lover. I've heard that one around, right? And they've made goofy movies, whatever. Okay, nope, not. She's also, and this is the important one, she is not the sinful woman that we just read about at Simon the Pharisee's house. It's not the same person. People confuse those. They, they, they try to make it. It's not. It's just not the same person. Mary from Magdala was not a prostitute. She was more likely an upper class kind of, I don't know, what's the aristocrat kind of person. And very possibly even friends with Joanna, the next person that's mentioned in this list. So Mary from Magdala, yes, she was, uh, she had evil spirits or, or demons uh, that w- were, uh, what do you want to call it? Cast out. Possessing. Yeah, they, they, well, they may have been possessing her, or whatever, but they were cast out. They were gone. And, and she was someone of some means. And again, possibly friends with Joanna. So who was this Joanna? Well, we actually do know just a little bit about her. She had a very close association with Herod's household. Kind of weird. Now, Luke, I don't know. You you get the feeling that Luke is trying to pair Mary and Joanna together. Luke, uh, it's like he seems to think they belong together uh, because he does it. He does it here and he does it once, I think, more toward the end of his book. Uh, But also... Joanna is one of the ones that discovered the empty tomb. And now here's the crazy part. Do you remember when Luke starts his gospel? Who's he writing to or who does he address in his beginning? Most excellent Theophilus. And who does he address at the beginning of the book of Acts, the other book that Luke wrote? Same guy. Yeah. It's possible based on, you know, some, I don't know, something archaeological or something, she might even be the granddaughter of that same Theophilus. Now, I can't prove it. I don't know. It's just what other people say. But it's a very interesting connection. Very interesting. Yeah. Now, this Susanna person, uh, I'm just going to say I've read some stuff. On, I think it basically, basically boils down to, you know what? We don't know anything about her. Maybe she came from Alabama with a banjo on her knee. It could be. And, you know, I mean, honestly, I hope she's not crying for us because that. (laughs) If you don't get the reference, we're moving on. (laughs) Even if you do get the reference, we're moving on. So, yeah, Susanna, we don't know anything about her. And then it says, and many others. And just just to be clear. That little phrase in the Greek, it's feminine. So we've got Mary, Joanna. Susanna, and then apparently when it says many others, it means many other women. And then it says this, who provided for them out of their means. Who do you think the word them applies to, Samuel? Wouldn't it be Jesus and his apostles? Yeah, yeah. And who is their means? The women's means. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. But... It seems, you know, everything that we think we know, everything we've tried uh, figuring out, putting together, piecing together, discovering, a substantial portion of all of the funding and food and lodging, everything to do with Jesus's ministry, it's provided by women. Some of them married. And I mean, mean, just again, it was a patriarchal society, so it's not like we're saying anything bad. They, they were providing out of, you know, call it their husband's means, but and giving it to Jesus and the apostles. That's just crazy, especially when some of them come like really close to Herod's household. And uh, you may have had some who were widows. And yet somehow in their position, they had the ability to, to continue to provide funds or whatever. I don't know. Whatever it was, there was a lot of money associated with Herod and his family. It's possible that Joanna was in on some of that, maybe even Mary in some way. 
But these other women, they, their money came from somewhere. And all I can say is, thank you, ladies. Yeah. Right? I mean, it, it's, it is an image, a picture that you simply never have in your head. That all of their money, not all, most of their money is provided by women in the story. It's great. That's awesome. I'm glad we're bringing that to light. Yeah. A lot of people, they just keep wanting to look at Christianity and, you know, like it's, oh, it's ridiculously patriarchal, you know. It's just a lot of misunderstanding there. All right. Mm -hmm. Now we got to really switch. We're, I mean, we're moving. So remember, we're trying to do this chronological thing and we're, you know, dependent on other people and, you know, however they think it's going to go. We're making a big move here, Samuel. We're going to move to, uh, let's see, it's Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 to 50, and then Mark chapter 3, verses 31 to 35, and Luke chapter 8, verses 19 to 21. Got anything before we go? No. All let's right. Let's keep rolling. All right. I think I'm going to read from Mark. I may pick a little bit up from Luke there just to, as a side note, but here we go. Mark three thirty one says this, and his mother and his brothers came... This would be Jesus' mother and brothers. His mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Whoa. How'd you like to be at that family meeting, huh? Whew, crazy, right? Now, just I, I, I'm going to read this little bit from Luke. We'll talk about it later. He ends it this way, but he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. I'm just, I'm reading it in defense of us. We keep saying stuff like that. And I just want to keep going to the text saying it's not my fault. It's what it says, yep. right? Yep. All right. So let's see if we can kind of, I don't know. This, see, this is such a weird jump and you don't know where you are, wh who you're with, whatever. So in Mark... This follows just a little bit after we hear this funny thing about Jesus' family, okay? It says that they were hearing that, I don't know, he wasn't eating, and it even says that, that they thought Jesus was out of his mind. So, Samuel, why don't you read Mark 3, verses 20 and 21. Show us what we're talking about. Then he went home, that is Capernaum, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. And, I mean, how many times do you read your Bible, and how many times do you remember that his family thought he was crazy? It's important pictures, just to see it. Now, that bit actually gets, uh, you know, the, the part that you were just reading, all that 20 through 30 or something like that, that all gets uh, sequenced a little bit later in our chronological approach, but I wanted to at least mention it because it kind of adds some interesting flavor to the story right here where we're at. So as we can see, his families, they're just really not on board the whole Messiah train. Uh, they will be later, but they're probably concerned about him and they're probably a little concerned about themselves. And, and what kind of things are we talking about? Well, you know, reputation or possibly political blowback, etc. I mean, it, it, he's family. And so, it's bound to affect them in some way. Now, I do want to mention this, though. When you're reading verse 21, the Greek is really, really general. It, it, maybe you could even say it was ambiguous or something. It could be that in verse 21, when it talks about family, it isn't specifically talking about his mother and his brothers. It's just talking about family generally. It could be those related, even living in other areas or who knows, whatever. So it could be that general family is upset and not his mother and brothers. And then when you get down to verse 31, you know, it's very explicit that it's his mother and brothers. And so 
maybe they aren't thinking he's crazy. Maybe they're just acting out of love or, or, you know, who knows, whatever. Don't know. That's a possibility. But one thing, I guess, if you want to say, the one thing that we it, we are certain of, his family shows up, they want him to uh, at least come out and talk to him. You do get the idea they want him to come home with them. They want, how do I say this? They want him to follow them. And we, reading on the outside 2,000 years later, know they're the ones who needed to follow him. Anyway, so so uh, we've seen situations like this before. They're they're uh, I guess likely they're at Peter's house, but you know it's unclear. We don't really know. But we got big crowds. People can't even get close. So obviously that reminds us of other stories at Peter's house. It, it doesn't really say, but you know, I, what do you think that he was doing there, Samuel? What are the kind of things he was involved in? Well, he was regularly teaching to people. Teaching, he was healing people. Healing. I mean, general social, cultural interactions. Yeah, yeah, casting out demons, maybe. His mother and his brothers get there in the midst of all of this. And I mean, you know, this is kind of reasonable. They probably expect that they can get a message to him, request, you know, some sort of special treatment. Hey, could you interrupt what you're doing for a second? Could you just come out and talk to us? Reasonable. They're family. Somehow they get the message to him inside, and and uh, I, I think this is really good. What where's the wording on this? Uh, somebody says they call. Okay, and called him. They they standing outside. They sent him sent to him and called him, and that's really important because that word. I think the best way for us to think of it, if we we're going to try to pick a different English word, would be summon. They summoned him. And that is going to relate to stuff we'll talk about later when we start getting into the idea of calling and all that thing. So anyway, there's that. So they summon him, but I don't know, Sammy, what do you think? Jesus's reply. I mean, Sweet as pie, or is that just a little harsh? Surface level read, it does seem to bite a little bit. Yeah, that's kind of tough. Now, here's the thing. He's not actually saying it to their face because they're stuck outside the crowd. But he is sending a message to that inner crowd, the ones who are within hearing distance. He's basically sending the message that, hey, my family that's outside, that's not my true family. Wow, that's hard. His true family, he continues, is anyone who actually does the will of God, the will of the Father. And as Luke put it, those who hear and do. And here's the thing. Devotion to God supersedes earthly relationships. It's important that we see that because that is the very nature of how the Gentiles are included into the whole story. Not all Jews are Israel. Mm -hmm. So what it's saying is, just because you were physically born Jewish, blood Jewish, or even if you converted proselyte, that doesn't make you part of God's chosen people. And just because you weren't physically born into the nation of Israel doesn't mean you can't be Jesus's brother, if you will, sons of God. Mm -hmm. So that's a big, big, important picture to see. And here's Jesus painting that image right here. Now, See, I guess what I'm saying is we should also be careful to to show some preference for our true family. That is our fellow disciples, our fellow brethren who actually hear and do, who, who obey the will, do the will of God. However, I say that out loud and we also have to remember you know what? You don't want to become exclusive. You don't want to be isolated. You've got to interact with the world. You have to continue to live, but you don't have to be exclusive. You don't have to be isolated to simply show some preference. And so it's a, it's a good image. But then I got to ask this, Samuel. So we've talked about all those things, and that's the whole of the story. I mean, the next section we do, it's going to go on to something completely different. 
Here's the question. So did Jesus go and talk with his mother and brothers? No idea. (laughs) Exactly. We don't know. See, a lot of people, I think, read this story and, and on, on, on one hand, it's relating a really important point regarding family, but it never says explicitly one way or the other whether he actually went and talked to them. He could have said this and then said, so I would like you, my mother and brother and sisters, to give me a moment while I go talk to my earthly family. Or right, I mean, He could have just got up right then and went and talked to them, but it doesn't say. We don't know. And remember, just that here's here's Samuel, one of the Ten Commandments: honor your your father and your mother. Yeah. Well, his mother standing outside saying, "Hey, could you please come talk to me?" Well, is Jesus disobeying that commandment if he just ignores her? Maybe, right? So, so does that apply here? And and I mean, how are we to take this story? I'm only asking the question. I'm only bringing it up because look, we need to be careful. What we assume in the text that isn't really there, and how that assumption might affect the way you treat people, the way you treat family, especially those who who you know we would consider not part of the true family of God. So mm-hmm. it's just a good lesson. Just don't want to get caught up in the story, and then all of a sudden, because I've actually. This is so sad. I've actually known people, they just dissed their whole family because they wouldn't immediately become Christians like them, you know? Mm -hmm. Sad, sad situation. Now, I I feel like this part of your teaching that you brought up, I'm kind of reeling and maybe other people are reeling on at the moment because you had said a few minutes ago that Jesus basically said to the crowd that his mother and his brothers that were waiting outside for him, they were weren't his true family and that instead his true family is anyone who does the will of God, the father. Right. But I'm thinking about all those months and months ago when we went through the the nativity story with Jesus's mother. And when I think about her and her character, I think of someone who does the will of God. Yeah. By how she embraced all of this change when God met her and how she accepted her role within the story. And so it's hard for me to hear Jesus saying that even his own mother isn't his true family with what we know about the story and her faith. So like, how do we reconcile that stuff? Yeah, well, okay, number one, let's just go with maybe I was a little too strong in my language. Maybe we can back up and say, well, okay, hold on. Jesus' point was, hey, I've got some physical relatives out there, and I've got you guys sitting here around me. The point that Jesus wants to make is, look, if I have physical relatives and they're not doing the will of God, if they're not hearing and doing, okay, they're not true family and, and you guys are. You guys are more my brother and sister and mother than they would be. But by the same token, if I've got some physical relatives out there and they are doing the will of God and they are hearing and doing, well, they're just as much of my true family as you guys sitting right here with me. Just because they're not sitting here with me at this moment doesn't, you know, somehow make that any less. So I guess part of what I was getting at is we we do see in Jesus's family once he actually really takes off in his ministry there seems to be a little bit of a gap that's formed a little bit of a a, a schism or a chasm i'm not sure what word i'm looking for and he sort of just takes off without him like they've been used to him just being big brother and you know running the house or whatever for a long time and now all of a sudden he's off doing this thing and later we see them seemingly acting and behaving differently like they really come alongside especially his mom even before he's gone his brothers more like after he's gone but coming in and going you know what buddy i'm i'm on the team i want to be here i want to hang out with you whatever so 
I didn't mean to give the impression that, hey, Mary and the brothers, boom, they're just out. They're not true family. Uh, Maybe they were. Maybe they weren't. But Jesus was using that to illustrate the point. And we do at least know there's a little bit of tension or something going on in the family. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Does that help a little? Yeah. Okay. For sure. Sorry. Didn't mean to. No, not at all. Make that weird. All right. Uh, Anything else? No, I'm just ready to see where the story goes from here. (laughs) Yeah, me too. I can't remember from moment to moment. So, all right, here we go. The next bit is Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, Mark chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, and Luke chapter 8, verse 4. I'm going to again read from Mark. It says this. Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, "Uh Uh-oh, cliffhanger. (laughs) I'm stopping there. (laughs) All right. So here's the thing. And, and, And now Luke tells us that we've got a great crowd gathering. And and he even says that they're coming from town after town. So that's Luke's image. Matthew and Mark, they go ahead and give us the little extra detail that they're out by the sea, the Sea of Galilee. And Matthew says that he started his teaching on the shore. I guess technically Mark did too. But we're keying on that word sat. Jesus went out of the house and he sat beside the sea. What does a teacher in Israel do when they want to teach, Samuel? They sit down. Exactly. So he was teaching on the shore. Now, ultimately, Matthew and Mark both have Jesus getting into a boat and teaching in the boat. And how does it say it? He got into the boat and sat down. Sat down. (laughs) Right. And so he's teaching. But he did that because the crowd is just getting too large. Now, the crowd's there on the shore and... You know, many, okay, do we really actually know exactly what spot he was teaching? No, we don't. But many speculate that this, it it probably would have made it so that the crowd could hear and that they, or maybe I should say more of the crowd could hear and that they could even hear better. So the, the, the expectation is they were at a place on the shore where the things in and around the shore made a bit of a natural amphitheater. So that as he was on the water, he was getting some 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 good spread of his voice, right? Mm-hmm. So it just for the mental image, you got that. But here's the thing. I, I broke off this little bit uh, to handle separately because these introduction, they're, they're only here to introduce a series of parables. And that's where we're heading, uh, Samuel. We're going to do a bunch of parables. This is going to be great. Oh boy. Yeah, this is going to be so good. So Mark says, I guess it's in a way that's particularly important to notice. He says he was teaching them many things in parables. Now, Samuel, did it say that he was trying to teach them? I don't believe so. Did it say he was tricking them? (laughs) It's not Halloween. Confusing them? Uh, Not that I can tell. Frustrating them? Mm -mm, No. Riddling them? (laughs) No. I think I'm beginning to see a point here. Yeah, he was teaching them. And we're going to talk about this a lot as we continue, but I just want to lay this out right here at the beginning, because I think that this is a, a widespread misunderstanding. Parables are not meant to bring confusion or to hide things or conceal things. They're meant to bring clarity. And so you need to hold on to that thought. Right here, we're going to look at the first parable, and then uh, we're going to end up talking more about what parables are about. But let's go ahead and get one, at least in our heads, and, and, and we'll be able to work from there. And that will just really quickly, before you jump into the first one, I just want to say, even as like a uh, non in in a non-religious context with a teacher, a, a true, efficient, 
successful teacher always tries to pursue clarity with their students instead of confusion. Yeah. Like, I taught a year of high school, and I can't tell you how frustrating my life became when my teaching resulted in confusion among my students. Right. Yeah. Like, I, my goal was to say things, have them do things together with me in order to bring clarity. So, yeah, just even in a basic logic sense, teachers should be seen as people bringing clarity, not confusion. Yeah. Or you wouldn't be a good teacher. Yeah. And you know what? This is also something in traditional Judaism, at least back at this time. And we think about uh, there's a, a Jewish idea uh, around the word chesed, right? How we do loving kindness. Um, and the idea is that it's the responsibility of the teacher to find a way to communicate in a manner that the student can comprehend. Mm -hmm. It doesn't all lie with the student, right? Obviously. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that is, oh, these are good pictures. Good, good pictures. All right. So let's, let's do this little bit. This is Matthew chapter 13 verses, well, it's kind of the end of, of verse 3, uh, through verse 9, and then Mark chapter 4 verses 3 through 9, and Luke chapter 8 verses 5 through 8. All right, and I think I'm going to read from Mark. So here we go. Listen. Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears, let him hear. Okay. So that is an example of a parable, not that we haven't seen one before now, but, and this is also probably a super common, well-known parable. I mean, even some people in church probably have some idea about seeds and soils and all that, right? That was supposed to be people not in church who might still be familiar. Thank you very much. Anyway, here you go. There's your parable. Now, I'm not actually going to work through an explanation of this right now because Jesus is going to explain it himself later. So we're just going to talk about a few other things. All three Gospels have offered this parable, and yet there's no context. Having listened to our podcast all the way through, you can probably guess that we're going to tell you that this parable is about what, Samuel? Jesus says, you on Gelion, the kingdom. <laughs> the kingdom, that's right. But... To be fair, the text doesn't explicitly give us that here in the initial parable. So, uh, again, Jesus is going to explain it. We'll get to the details then. Now, at this time and in this place, they were still a predominantly agrarian culture. Most people at this time, okay, they grew crops, raised animals. That was the world that they knew. But many of us reading or listen to the podcast, whatever, uh, we may know little or nothing of raising crops. And yet, this parable, it even makes sense to us, at least on the surface, thinking about plants and seeds and whatever, dirt. But here's the important point. Jesus wasn't giving farming advice. It's not like there were a bunch of idiots roaming around the countryside just throwing seed any old where they wanted and wondering why sometimes it worked <laughs> and sometimes it didn't, right? No, Jesus is not giving farming, farming advice. In this parable, Jesus is using something that is familiar to create 
imagery that can then be applied outside of its original context. Now, this really isn't all that foreign to us. Today, we talk about things like metaphor or analogy, etc. And parables, I mean, they're, they're kind of in that same ballpark. But those are the things that are normal for us. Well, this was normal for them. The point is, you know this. You live this every day. Your mind can easily map something that is familiar over the top of something that is unfamiliar, and all of a sudden, it makes sense. Right, Samuel? You do that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's exactly what's happening here. Jesus is helping them do that. And again, the explanation interpretation comes later, but there you go. Uh, One final bit that he ends up with, uh, he said, he who has ears, let him hear. Now, we've seen this before, but... I actually think the usage right here in this one particular spot is kind of cool, kind of remarkable even, right? It's a callback to Ezekiel 12 too. How about you go ahead and read that for us, Samuel? Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house, who have eyes to see, but see not, who have ears to hear, but hear not, for they are a rebellious house. And see, what's important is you can see in this, There is a call at the end of the parable. There's a call to actually hear the parable, understand it, obey its message, if you will, which ultimately is going to be repent, seek the kingdom, etc., whatever. Uh, The point is, don't be the rebellious house that's being spoken of like back in Ezekiel 12. But it's kind of cool. Because it also leads into the next part of the story. And, uh, well, this is where Jesus, uh, he, he talks about why he's even using parables in the first place. And so, I mean, you got to see all three, all three of the gospel writers here, Matthew, Mark, and Luke did this. This is just really good storytelling. It's like they're, they're foreshadowing the very thing that they're going to do. And they're getting the, the, the reader's mindset in the right, but this is just really good. So, Mm. all right. So the next bit. Uh, We move on to Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 through 14, uh, Mark chapter 4, 10 through 12, and Luke chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. I'm going to go back to Matthew because he's got a lot of information here. And in fact, I've kind of broken his in half. Uh, We'll have to show you what's going on there. But let's do this first bit. (laughs) Hopefully, (laughs) if we end up having to stop the episode, we're going to be right in the middle of a thought. (laughs) But what are you going to do? Here we go. Matthew 13, 10 says this. Then the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, to you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, it has not been given. For to the one who has more, more will be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. Now, technically, Matthew does continue, uh, but I'm breaking it off here. Samuel, having heard that, heard me read it, I I tried not to mess with it too much or whatever, I just tried to do a a a reading. If you had to, just quickly summarize it, what do you think Jesus is saying right there? What do you think the average ordinary person is hearing when they read it right there? Oh, that is a tough question. Um, I mean, it's almost like there's this invisible wall that's distinguishing his apostles from everybody else in terms of their ability to grasp what Jesus is saying. And it's almost as if he's... it. You could take it as if he is 
saying these things to further confirm their inability to hear and understand. Yeah, yeah. You could even say it kind of sounds like Jesus is putting up a wall. And I'm so glad you answered that way because all you did was feed into our narrative. This is perfect. So, remember what I said earlier about parables. What were they for, Samuel? They were meant to bring clarity and not confusion. Yeah. So that makes what's written right here really hard to understand. What the heck is going on? So, let me just make a general point first. There's one really important thing about communication. And it doesn't matter if it's spoken or written or whatever. And I know we've talked about it before. I'm just going to say it again. There's a difference between what a thing says and what it's saying. Let me give you an example. Okay. When I was a kid, my dad, he was a very funny guy. He might say something like this to me. You know, I just walk in the room, gets home from work, something like that. Hey, thanks for keeping an eye on the couch while I was away. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Now, now, the truth is, he was saying something very different from what he said. He wasn't actually expressing a true heartfelt gratitude for my loyal attentiveness to the safety of our family furniture. Instead... He was being my smart aleck dad, and he was calling me out for, like, you know, not doing my chores or something, right? And, okay, so this is sarcasm. I get it's kind of extreme as an example, but you get the idea. You get the idea that you have to be careful, and it basically boils down to, look, if you're taking things too literally and not seeing the full context, you're going to misunderstand some things. So... I don't know. You just have to get that in your head so that you can understand when I'm trying to explain how it is that Jesus is not boxing them out in the zone. You know what I'm saying? It's not that picture. Okay. So uh, another little thing about this, this, this section appears to be somewhat of an aside from the main story. I mean, it feels like it's happening outside of when all the parables were being delivered to the crowds. I mean, it, one of them, or a couple of them even say that, you know, when he was alone or, you know, they, they asked him privately or something. Uh, it, but it's inserted in this place to bring, I mean, funny, to bring clarity. And in some ways, though, it raises some questions. And we'll, we'll talk about that more as we go. But now let's get down to business. Why the parables? He makes this statement. To you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. By the way, there's your first clue that this parable is about the kingdom. (laughs) And he says, uh, to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, it has not been given. Okay. So you could read that as, hey, this is for you guys, and I'm keeping it a secret from them, so they're out. Okay, but... You shouldn't read it that way. It's not as if God is trying to keep something from them. Jesus is simply saying, you guys, you get to hang out with me 24-7. You get deep, consistent, thorough teaching. You get to see me walk it out. We do all this stuff together. You are living the secrets of the kingdom all the time. These guys, they're just showing up here and there to hear some stories. They don't have the same advantage of you, the same advantage as you. And so the parables are the best method to communicate the message of the kingdom to them. Now, uh, also, we know that the, this bit about they may indeed see but not perceive, they may indeed hear but not understand, that kind of stuff. This is from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And again, If you were back in Isaiah, you would understand the full context if you were reading around. So so we shouldn't be seeing Jesus saying to them, listen, I'm going to make it so that they can see me and hear me. But trust me, they're never going to get what I'm saying. I mean, who knows? They might actually repent if they got what I was saying and we can't have that. Okay. That sounds ridiculous, right? 
Why would Jesus come here and do that? That doesn't make any sense. It's just absurd. Why would you even bother speaking at all? Well, the same way when you're reading Isaiah, if we focus on what is actually being communicated, what we will see there is that God is sending his messenger with a message of of repentance despite the state of the people. The state of the people is that they have already become unresponsive. So he's sending out his messenger and he's letting his messenger know, look, they're going to see you. They're going to hear you. They're not going to get it. They're not going to respond. They're going to resist. God told not just Isaiah, he told Jeremiah and Ezekiel, similar kinds of things. They're not going to listen to you. And I'm just going to say this as a side note. Uh, A lot of times when you're reading this, you'll notice the word but in there, and it's just a generic conjunction, and so and is equally viable, and and is probably going to give you a better sense of what's being said. Just thought I'd throw that in there. But by quoting this, Jesus is saying that the crowds are in the same danger as were the people in Isaiah's time, or even Jeremiah and Ezekiel, right? The parables are an attempt to break through their dullness, make his message somehow easier to apprehend. It's not Jesus and God who are keeping the truth from them. It's they who are slow or dull or refusing to see and hear. And we're going to talk about more of that below as well. And now, and I know I I, I can feel it for the people that have been reading it this way for a long, 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 long time. They're going, I just ain't buying it, Paul. I just ain't buying it because look at what it says for the one who has more will be given, right? But again, it's the same kind of story. You shouldn't read it as if God is taking things from those who have little For those who have little, the natural outcome of their current state is even the little they have will be carried away or taken away. And you can actually even relate that back to the birds in the parable of the sower on the path. It's going to be taken away. This isn't a pronouncement of judgment. It's an observation and a warning For those who have much, the natural outcome of their current state is, you know what, they're probably going to gain more and more. The parables are an attempt to move them from little toward much. And we're going to do it. We're going to end up breaking this whole thought in half right in the middle of a podcast. (laughs) But what are you going to do? Yeah. I mean, it gives people some time to wrestle and meditate and contend on what Jesus's true purpose with parables are before we actually start hitting the the ground running with them. So I think it's a good place to kind of give people some space to live in the tension. Yeah, yeah. So it, from what I've said thus far, and, and remembering we'll have more at the beginning of the next podcast, uh, very relevant and good you know, related to the parables and Jesus' purpose. But what we've got so far and what I'm explaining, not so much asking if you agree or disagree, is it making sense? Is it is it clear what I'm trying to get at, Samuel? I mean, I think so, especially like I'm not trying to promote that all aspects within the Christian faith or the Jewish faith are meant to be taken in a 100% logical manner every single time. But if, if, if we strip away all of the baggage that a lot of these passages have with previous doctrines and theologies, and you just think about Jesus interacting with the people who, for one reason or another, are struggling to understand how the Messiah's coming in that present time, how that fits within their worldview. Yeah. And Jesus is meant, like, his whole point in coming was trying to hand, like, 
He's got the keys to the kingdom, like to exp- <laughs> right. like explode through that wall right in front of him. He's like, I want you guys to have this. Like, why would Jesus cause more confusion and more opposition if that was his goal? Right. And so, like, just naturally, if I think if he wants people to understand, then the parable should be a tool in which he can accomplish that goal. Yeah. And what we don't know yet, because we're not there yet in the podcast, but even some of his parables in and of themselves are going to have in them the idea that we should be spreading this teaching everywhere, not hiding it. So, and, and we also know, we know that God doesn't shy away from people getting their consequences. And it's not about that. It's just, is God really going, you know what? I don't even want you to know. I'm cutting you off. Well, we've seen it in a, in a sense. I mean, he, they went to Babylon, right? He kicked them out of the promised land for all practical purposes. But it's just, it doesn't, it, I, I guess I'm agreeing with you. Logically, it, it just doesn't make any sense. And I'm making a, a big deal of it up front here and now. But you're going to see that after I've done that and we continue, it's only going to make the other parables and everything else we read make that much more sense. Yeah, I really hope it's going to refresh in people's interactions with the parables once we start going through them. Yeah, yeah, I think it will. I think it will. Anyway, for what it's worth, we got to stop. Okie dokie. Thanks for listening to the Okie dokie Most Podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Be sure to leave us a rating and a review to let us know how this content is impacting your life. You can find out more information about the podcast at www.okidokimos.com. And if you'd like to get a hold of us, please send us an email at okidokimos at gmail.com. And until next time, we pray that you will do your best to present yourself to God as one approved a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We'll talk to you all next week.